Thank you. Uh, I have this microphone on. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Great. So if there's any problems, just let me know. Thank you so much, Betty and Darlene, for having me. And I see we have a great turnout. So I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit. I am coming from the northern Virginia area, Reston, which is just outside of D.C. And never been to Williamsburg, but it, it appears to be really beautiful. So we're going to try and do a little sightseeing afterwards. But I um, work for a place called Amen Clinic. It is a private uh, practice psychiatric clinic, and we have actually clinics throughout the country, so we have seven. And our uh, clinic specializes in brain imaging, and so it's what makes us unique. We also treat general psychiatric issues. I myself have addiction training. I did a fellowship at Yale University in addiction psychiatry and a uh, wonderful experience. And then I also worked up um, at Harvard for a while teaching faculty. So I, uh, I really feel very passionate about addiction. It's one of um, something that I really feel close to my heart as well. I had family members who have struggled with addiction and I've seen how it affects families and uh, the whole system. So these are things that I, I really want to um, share with you because I, I feel there's a definite uh, personal touch to that. So I'm going to go ahead and explain some of what we do at Amen Clinic and how it interfaces with addiction, not just diagnostically, but treating. And I know you have a syllabus, and it has all of my slides, it appears. So uh, those slides could be a little technical. If there are any things that um, I, I can certainly explain in more detail, I did kind of want to wait until the end for questions because then I will get sidetracked. I have a little bit of ADD myself, so I don't want us to be off topic. I'd love to finish all of this. And then I know we're taking a break at 10. So let me go ahead and get started. <clears throat> and that's just my little disclosure statement. Mm -hmm. So I have about, uh, looks like, five objectives up here. One is review neuroanatomy of the brain. And I know a lot of you are in the field, therapists and physicians and um, nurses. And so this will be a nice review for you, too. I have to tell you, when I started at the clinic, I actually needed to review myself. You learn in training all of these things about the brain, but if you're not using them routinely. It can be easy to uh, kind of get those things rusty. We're also going to identify brain imaging that is most beneficial uh, in treating addictions and mental health. We'll classify varying patterns of addiction that we see with neuroimaging. Uh, pinpoint treatments that are available based on the brain systems we'll see. And then I also want to spend a little bit of time highlighting dual diagnosis, uh, which I'm certain many of you are very familiar with. So I'd like to start actually with a case study. I, this is actual patient of mine. Uh, I saw this gentleman about a year, actually probably two years ago now. And his chief complaint uh, coming into the clinic was that his marriage is falling apart. So this is a 58-year-old uh, married white male, a football player, very talented, played in high school and college. He uh, is a local businessman, very successful, uh, ran a car dealership, but doing very well. Had a terrible motor vehicle accident about two years ago, ended up hitting his head on the steering wheel and the uh, airbag deployed. So he had a, a, what we suspected a brain injury. So when he came in to see me, uh, these were some of the main um, complaints or the, some of the main things he reported to us. So clearly in the, in the beginning, he says his marriage uh, is in crisis and he's been given an ultimatum by his wife. She says, listen, things have to change or I'm leaving. Uh, it turns out that through careful history, he's finishing about two to three bottles of wine a night. Initially, it said, you know, I just drink, you know, a couple times a week. But as you press him, it turns out it's pretty significant. He is sharing those with his wife, but two to three bottles is, is enough uh, to cause some problems. His work performance is starting to suffer, and he uh, shares with us that some of his employees have told him he's forgetful, um, he's uh, having trouble with... Uh, staying on task with some of the demands that they have at the car dealership. His primary care doctor just diagnosed an enlarged liver, fatty liver. He's had some frequent hangovers, so the next day after um, 
a night where he's up with his wife drinking, he's felt pretty crummy. He's had those failed attempts to cut back on how much he's drinking. And over the last six months, things have escalated. And he's had some periods uh, within the last six to 12 months where he's felt pretty depressed, irritable, thoughts about not living. Medical history, pretty much as you may imagine, enlarged liver. He's having some blood pressure issues. His doctor wants to put him on some, um, or I think he has put him on medication. You can see below there. The auto accident in 2013. Uh, and that actually, um, interestingly enough, the auto accident, when he went to the ER, they basically did a scan neck down. So they weren't looking, and I mean scan, not necessarily meaning imaging, but nothing's broken, nothing's bleeding, you're going home. And that's not uncommon, especially with auto accidents, is they're not looking from the neck up unless there's, unless there's really some cognitive complaints at the time. His BMI is 35. He has suspected sleep apnea. His wife um, complains of a lot of air, noise at night, gasping, snoring, and his primary care has scheduled a sleep study. There's also no available lab testing when I saw him. And as you can see, let me see if this works. There's two medications. So one's a cholesterol medicine, and then one's a newly started blood pressure medication, the lisinopril. Family history. He has a mom with a family history of alcoholism. And his father uh, died at age 61 from heart disease, family history on his father's side of drug addiction. And there's one younger sibling with a history of, of drug addiction as well. Past psychiatric history, he had depression diagnosed in 2010. No other significant hospitalizations, um, no suicide attempts. He wasn't actually treated for this depression with medications. He wasn't in therapy. And then he has a history of impulsivity in the last two years. So it turns out he's been spending more. Uh, there's actually an infidelity or one or two infidelities. And uh, this was something that his wife had discovered recently and a previous reckless driving charge. And when I met with this gentleman, heavy set, uh, casually groomed, he was, he was pretty remorseful, uh, downcast eyes, uh, it appeared to have some word finding memory problems, uh, mood was described as down, his affect was restricted. So he's asking for my help, your help, in this scenario. So I want to pause a minute and just kind of get some feedback from you all and kind of see what would be your next steps. And there's really no wrong answers here, but I just want to kind of generate some conversation. Alcohol history prior to the accident. He did not. It was it was more on the border of unsafe drinking levels rather than clear abuse. But he had been drinking most of his life. And cognitive assessment. Cognitive assessment. Um, we did some neurocognitive testing, which I did not include here. But he had uh, what appeared to be impaired short-term memory uh, and some attentional distractions. So we. Also did a Connors performance, which is an ADD type test, and he was impaired in that too. I would ask him when he wants to get out of treatment. Okay, great question. That is a good one. Um, yes, sir. Ask him what he uses to help himself get some sleep. This alcohol help him sleep, and he doesn't use it every time. Okay, great question too. I'm trying to recall. He he basically is drinking enough late at night. He's falling asleep pretty quickly. But from my experience with uh, most people who are drinking that heavily, is their sleep is so fractured. REM is REM is disturbed. So they're up frequently through the night. They'll say, "Oh, I'm in the bathroom a lot." Well, that's because the body's processing out all of that alcohol. So, okay, great questions. So let me jump ahead. We're going to come back to Mr. EJ in just a moment. So I want to kind of gear off for a moment and talk about the brain, because that's a big part of why we're here. So as you can see, there, it's pretty complex. I have a few interesting facts up there. Uh, 100 billion neurons, 40,000 connections between cells. Uh, you can see, I think that's a trillion or more connections in the brain overall. Uh, it's 2% of the body's weight. 
and it actually uses about 30% of the calories we consume a day, which I think is remarkable. <laughs> it's pretty soft. Now this is something, when I started working where I work now, I didn't realize how soft or vulnerable the brain is. It's about the consistency of soft butter, butter you leave out on the table when you're cooking, or a raw egg, that's pretty soft. Um, the skull, of course, is very hard. There are a lot of sharp edges inside. Uh, minor sphenoid wing, which kind of circles the uh, temporal lobes, very sharp. One of the areas that is often vulnerable to injuries. Uh, it's something that brain, it really makes brain injuries matter because if we're not thinking about brain injury in a sense of um, even people that have been through a car accident, it's not your NFL guy or your college of uh, fame guy, this type of person, but even people that have had some um, modest injuries in the past, we should be thinking about how that may affect their current status. So one of the big questions we ask where I work is, how do you know if you don't look? <laughs> kind of a fun little <laughs> video. <laughs> and honestly, I never thought of it until I started here um, at Amen Clinic because I had been trained in traditional psychiatry. Uh, of course, we did lab work. We did imaging, um, mostly with people who were having first break episodes, uh, if there were some questionable medical issues. But we didn't routinely do imaging. And I'll have to say, when I did order it, other doctors looked at me as if I was from another planet. You're a psychiatrist. What are you doing? Why are you ordering imaging? Even with lab work. So. Our, our approach at Amen Clinic is a little bit different because we do feel like there is an integrative approach that needs to be done where you're looking, you're measuring data, you're gathering labs, because there may be other things that haven't come up that you wouldn't necessarily get from a questionnaire or an intake. So just a little bit about imaging. Of course, most of you have probably heard about like CTs and MRIs. Those are very standard images that get done in an ER setting or even outpatient. And with those, you're looking for structural issues. That just means these are snapshots. You're looking at anatomy. You're looking for, this is a big one, is, is there a bleed? You're also looking if there's tumors. Uh, and so those are the biggies. And that's where they become very important. And if you have an injury, most of the time if you've been in an auto accident, if they're going to scan you, they'll be with one of those or an x-ray. So we call those structural images. Now if we think about functional images, there are about three different categories up here. There are a few others that kind of get done here and there, but fMRI, PET, and SPECT are the main functional ones. And again, that term functional is the key because that basically is describing how well is this part of the body working. We use fMRI because they're using it for cancer. Um, you're mapping tumors. You're looking for areas to make surgical intervention. The PET is also a functional scan. It's um, something that's more costly. So it's generally done more in the research setting, uh, and that is using uh, fluorescent tagged glucose, so you're looking for activity in the body. Our SPECT images are very similar to PET, except that we're using a radioactive isotope, which sounds a little scary, but it's actually fairly safe. Um, but we're looking for blood flow patterns, so we're not necessarily looking at glucose metabolism with SPECT. We're looking for blood flow. And that's basically what I'm describing here, is it's called single photon emission computed tomography, quite the mouthful. And as I mentioned, it's looking at brain blood flow and activity. We're using small amounts of technetium, which is a, an isotope. It wants to decay to a stable state. If you guys remember chemistry and isotopes, they always are looking for a stable um, state to be in. And so every time they decay to a stable state, they emit a photon of light. We capture those lights or those, those photons into an image that's generated, and it looks pretty similar to what I have up here. So this is representing a, a picture of somebody's brain. And we're going to go into more detail about each of those areas of that brain in a moment. Uh, and again, I, I think um, SPECT, for, for my purposes and what I do, it, it's very helpful because you're looking at areas of the brain that are working well, areas that don't work well enough, that are underactive, 
And then there are areas that we'll see in scans that are working overtime. They're working too hard. And all of that will make a difference when, when we talk about some of these images and, and the work that, that I'm doing. So you have, um, I have a list of indications for brain spec imaging. And it starts with brain trauma, physical trauma. We use it for diagnostics uh, with dementia or cognitive decline, cerebrovascular disease, stroke, epilepsy. Uh, we're also using it in psychiatric terms because we're looking at people's brains if they're having significant violence, suicidal or homicidal behavior, exposures like drugs or alcohol. We're using it to subtype ADD and depression, uh, clarify issues such as OCD and PTSD, post-traumatic stress. And even in more um, rare cases or atypical cases where we're seeing psychiatric uh, presentations where people just don't get better after several different types of treatment. Neuropsychiatric Lyme is down there. I'm not going to talk much about that, but it's just, it's just one of the things we do with uh, brain spec imaging. So one thing that I get a lot of from folks is when they come in to see me and we're doing an image, they want to get a really clear diagnosis. And I think we all feel that way. If we're, if we're struggling with something, we want to know what's going on. So one thing, real key thing that I have to make sure I share with people is that it doesn't necessarily give me a perfect diagnosis, but it helps me ask better questions. And I think as, as clinicians here in the room, um, I being one of them, is we always want to ask better questions. I'm always trying to learn from my patients, what's a better way to ask about suicide? What's a better way to ask how they're feeling, their depression, et cetera? And so this is one tool. Um, it's obviously not perfect, but I think it has given me um, a springboard to really get into what else could be going on. It opens up people who may not have been as forthcoming with some of the things that are going on. And that I, I can, we'll, we'll, it'll be a little more clear when we go through some of this, but you'll, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. We're looking at understanding underlying physiology, so the brain activity. And uh, as I said earlier, we're looking for that overactive, underactive area or injured area. <clears throat> and this is another image. This is the internal working of a brain on spec. So the earlier picture I showed you, that rainbow image, that's the surface of the brain. So we also look interior too, and we'll go over that in a moment. So we also want to improve compliance. We're not just asking good questions, but we also want people to see these images because when they see what their brain is doing, whether it's working well or not, it can be pretty impactful on their treatment plan. I'll have many examples of people who come in thinking, you know, they're not too invested maybe in the whole process. And when they see these pictures, they go home. I don't hear from them for like three to six months, a call, no answers. They come back in six months and say, OK, I want another scan because I've been doing everything you told me to do. And I'm thinking, well, that's awesome. And they'll say, because I don't want a brain that looks like that. So and this, this, um, these two pictures, again, this is, this is the surface of the brain. This is underneath. So I will explain a lot of this. I know I'm just throwing images at you right now, but we'll go over some of that. This is another picture, under surface view of the brain. So we're looking at um, kind of the interior underneath. This is the prefrontal cortex. We're looking interiorly. This is part of that ventricular area, this cerebellum in the back. I'll go into more detail, but this is just pictures of unhealthy brains here. And one of the things I like about SPECT, it also decreases stigma. And I, at least weekly, I have people coming in with loved ones who are just up to here. And they say, listen, we're at our last leg. Kind of like that, that uh, wife at the beginning with our uh, patient. I just don't know what else to do. This is it. And when they look at their loved one's brain, they say, oh, wow, no wonder. Now, that doesn't excuse what that loved one might be doing or the behaviors they're engaging in, but it makes it a lot easier to have empathy. And empathy for themselves. So decreasing that guilt and that shame that they may have over their behaviors, their emotions. <clears throat> we also like SPEC because we can actually track improvement in the treatment plan, track their clinical improvement, but we can see it on the images too. 
So we'll often have people return within six to 12 months to do another scan. And we use it to motivate. So that's kind of going all hand in hand with that compliance issue. Again, these are pictures, surface view of the brain, top down view. So we're looking from above down on that brain. Improving compassion, understanding. This is um, a little more um, difficult for some, some of the people I meet with, but there are people that, infrequently, but people I do see that have so far, um, not, I don't want to say far gone, but they, they've gotten to that point in their illness where it is pretty difficult to treat. And you can see that looks like almost a whole part of the brain is missing here. This is a frontotemporal, it's more a frontal dementia. So it isn't that the brain is missing, but there's extremely low blood flow in here. And when people see that, um, families, they understand, but they also know, wow, maybe we need to start planning and kind of get things in order because it's, it's a bit grim when you see this kind of severe change. Another thing that's great about SPECT, there was a study out of Creighton they looked at um, 100 teenagers who were diagnosed with bipolar, admitted to the hospital. And as you can see, they did a 50-50. So 50 of them were scanned, 50 were not. And the length of stay went was uh, actually looks like even less than half. And uh, so you're looking at cost savings as well. Now, obviously, there are probably some dynamics in there, uh, confounding variables that might need to be looked at. But overall, it's pretty impressive. There's also, and this is more relevant to um, the crowd here today, but there's a Sierra Tucson study, Sierra Tucson well-known treatment center out in the Arizona area. And uh, they did a 2008 study looking at uh, admissions. They did uh, just questionnaires, and they found that 60% of substance uh, rehabilitation admissions had a brain injury. So going to veer off again and talk about the internal workings of the brain. So this is a little bit of a refresher for I'm certain most of you. I, oh, sorry about that, let me go back. Um, you can see this is the lateral view, and I've labeled some of these areas, and I think you have a handout that kind of goes through more of the detail. So we'll just touch on each of these sections because these are the images that we see in our scan. So we'll look at the prefrontal cortex, the temporal lobes, cerebellum down here, occipital lobe, and then parietal lobe. So as I referred earlier, these are the images. When, I do a, when we're doing scans with people at our clinic, we're doing a very thorough intake, a very long history. It takes a couple of days. Um, we do a lot of neurocognitive testing, and we're doing these scans. Most, most people do, but not everybody. So, when I look at these pictures, these are the images I'm going to get. I'm going to get a surface view, and then as we call it the active view, it's really the interior. And we're looking at interior structures, mainly in the limbic system. So on this side, which is, a, is the left side, this is our healthy surface. You can see a nice, smooth uh, looking brain compared with this brain that has two strokes. So this smoothness conveys good blood flow. This is how we um, look at our scans. Again, we use a very uh, complicated computer algorithm. We're generating these images in a 3D manner. And you can see that this is a nice, beautiful looking, without knowing any more about the details of our scans, this is what we want to see when we review scans. The shape is really important here. So when we think about colors, and you're going to see a lot of different colors in these scans, coming up, but the shape here in that surface is the most important thing. And you can see it's nice and round. Symmetry is very important as well. And in comparison with what we have over here, where it looks like the brain's just been ravaged by something, you can see there's areas that look missing. That is the, that's the difference that, that we're looking for if there's been injury. Now, this is from stroke. You can see that there's areas in the prefrontal, which is this top portion here, temporal and parietal lobe here on the side, and even towards the back where that cerebellum sits. So all of this does not mean if we were to open this person's brain up and look inside, we wouldn't see missing tissue. And I think that's important to understand because I'll have people look at these scans and they're, oh my God, 
I have missing brain function. Well, it's not that your brain is missing, but there's areas that are so significantly low with blood flow that this is how our pictures are generated. And these are pretty dramatic. I think it really brings home for people. Um, it can be a little scary, but that is something that really makes an impact. This is just another kind of comparison to healthy on the left. This is a typical Alzheimer's look. Alzheimer's, for, for our purposes, will see changes in the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe. This is a top-down view of the brain, so we're looking from above. You're really only going to be able to image most of the top-down view. You're catching the parietal and the prefrontal. The temporal lobe we're going to see in a moment underneath. This is a traumatic brain injury, TBI. Drug use. Heavy drug use, drug abuse. So that pockmark appearance is a fairly common look that we'll have. And this varies to a degree based on the type of drug or if it's alcohol use uh, to a degree. So of course, again, this isn't a perfect system. We are asking better questions here. So I may have someone who comes in with this. I'm thinking, well, that has a very common pattern I've seen with opiates. And it turns out they're also using a lot of alcohol etc. So these are just things that help us ask better questions. Now this is a picture interior. So I mentioned that earlier. It's imaging the inside. We're looking at the limbic system. We're looking at the cerebellum. The limbic system, um, as many of you may recall, it's kind of the emotional part of the brain. It regulates a lot of emotions, anxiety, depression, mood. It gets involved with cognitive and emotional flexibility. And the goal with these pictures, this is our healthy view. You can see there's a lot of red color down here at the bottom. This is the bottom part of the brain. Less of it towards the middle and front. And this middle and front is where your limbic system sits. So when we look inside, that's the image we want to see. That's healthy. It's balanced. This is OCD. So the reason we like the images we have is because those colors are pretty, they're pretty easy to grasp. The red it represents high levels of blood flow. We're getting into the 95th and 98th percentile blood flow with these colors, the red. Blue is average around 50 to 60. So when you look at all that blood flow, it naturally, at least it does for me, um, makes me think, wow, that's a lot of activity going on. High blood flow, high activity. So if you think about your, your patient with OCD, they're obsessive, they're compulsive, they're anxious, they're rigid. And there's, because there's so much blood flow going in certain areas of the brain, those are creating those symptoms. So when you see someone with this much activity, that's a flag that there's something out of balance. This is a, a picture of seizure activity. Again, you're looking at excess blood flow in the limbic system creeping into some of this temporal lobe area. I know that I'm covering a lot of systems and areas that we may not... I'll show you a little bit later what I'm getting into, but I just want to give you a brief overview right now. And let me check my time. Okay, we're good. Uh, this is bipolar, someone in a manic condition. So I love this poster. I have it uh, framed in my office. <laughs> and every single teenager and young adult that comes in, I point it out. I want them to look at this. Now, Clearly, I'm not going to read to everybody, but a lot of them are shocked, and I think uh, for good reason. So we have this actually hanging in many high schools now, but you can see that, and it's a little hard maybe, but each of these pictures on the ring represent brains that have been using alcohol or drugs. Marijuana is this picture at the top. Yeah. <laughs> Inhalants down here. Uh, we have alcohol at the very top. Unfortunately, and I've talked with uh, our chief, and he hasn't gotten on it yet, but I want to have an opiate picture in here, and I, we just don't have that yet. There is one for cocaine right here. We have it, actually. If you want, we can mail you some. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if we can coordinate with Darlene for anyone who would like one, yeah. Yes, sir. It should, yes, sir. I have information. Yeah. Oh wait, three three references. There should be actually several. There's there's 
Yeah, is it three slides? Yes, but there's more than just three references. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So I'll make sure, make a mental note to talk to Darlene or Betty. Uh, so again, I'm just going to keep showing some pictures. They're kind of um, pretty striking. Toxicity. So toxicity, when we use that word toxicity, it could mean a variety of things. Again, asking better questions. We're looking for that smoothness here. You can see that this brain looks pretty pockmarked. This actually, I believe, is toxicity from um, chemicals at work. It is not a substance look. But again, you can see it's fairly similar to kind of what we see in some of these pictures. So. This is an underneath view. I know I've been talking about a top-down view of the brain, so we flip it and look underneath. And that's, a, that's kind of the, where we're looking more at those temporal lobes right in the middle, prefrontal at the top. And then we have those lateral pictures. This is Xanax toxicity. Cocaine and methamphetamine, pretty similar patterns. Alcohol, oh, good, here we go. We have the heroin picture there. Heroin, from, from my experience, has been one of the most devastating um, to the brain images that we have. Marijuana. <laughs> so I'm, I don't know about you all in this area of Virginia, but um, I'm in the uh, Northern Virginia area. A lot of college students looking to go to really high-end schools and lots of competition. And a lot of them... Um, are experimenting, especially now in high school. They have these e-cigs they're using. They're sticking pods in uh, for e-cigs and nicotine, but they're also um, using some of those e-cigs to get um, marijuana. So I, I spend a lot of time trying to educate them on this. Um, I do not believe marijuana is a health food. Um, I think there's, <laughs> and you'll be surprised how many people tell me, oh no, it's natural, it comes from the ground. Well, there's a lot of things that are grown and that are addictive and harmful. Cocaine, opiates. So uh, I spend a lot of time talking to young adults and teenagers about marijuana. One of the things that I think, and this I could go on for a while about, but I think that most of our country and the legislatures are getting carried away with trying to medicalize it. I think there's a few key things that can be used for medical treatment. Um, but in general, I feel that we're trying to do this backdoor legalization. And so, unfortunately, the message that we're sending to our youth is that medical marijuana is safe and regular marijuana may be safe too. So at any rate, I, like I said, I could go on for a while. But I, I like to show this because I want them to understand that this may happen to you if you use enough. What's interesting is marijuana is hitting this prefrontal area and these temporal lobes and there is a reference that I included. We did a study um, within our clinic. We did a retrospective study looking at scans of marijuana and non-marijuana users. And we're able to identify who is and who is not smoking based on what we see, which areas are affected. So it's something I feel a bit passionate about. How much would a person have to? Well, that varies. That's a good question because I have some people who, hold on. I think it's stuck. Oh. Well, I have some people who end up using um, maybe once a week, and then if it's daily, we're going to see more of that kind of picture. So the less frequent use, and it's also variable on how much THC content is in the marijuana. And so my understanding is that the marijuana available now, you know, 20 to even 50 percent. I was in Colorado last summer on vacation, and for research purposes, I went into one of their pot shops because I wanted to know what they're selling and how it was the cleanest, uh, sparkling, everything was shiny and well packaged. But the percentages of THC in most of their products went up to about 50%. So if you think about that in comparison with your, your, um, your father's marijuana from 1970s, which was, what, 5%? Tremendous, tremendous. So anyway. Yes. Brain yes, stopped. even even older. So um, even older patients that I see, most of the time the brain's very resilient between um, you know youth up until age 27, 28, and that resilience helps recovery a great deal. As we get older, clearly it becomes a little harder. Our resilience drops. However, I had a gentleman in his 60s, uh, heavy alcohol use, very low activity. Within nine months, he came back for another scan. Really nice improvement. 
he may never recover to the area he had been prior, but really did very well. So usually um, about six to 12 months is where we target people to start seeing that change in the scans. Research, though, that um, I've read actually pins it closer to one to two years where you're having the circuitry of the brain um, healing as well. Okay, let me just see if I can go back. Okay, so this is cocaine, alcohol. That's the mixture of cocaine and alcohol there. And that is a picture of before and after treatment. Okay, so I know I hit, uh, I kind of listed all these brain systems earlier. I'm going to go into some of them in a little more detail. And that's starting with your prefrontal cortex. Uh, maybe we can hit about three of these, and then I guess we're going to take a break at 10. So your prefrontal, it's the executive of the brain. It sits right behind your forehead. There are, um, your eyes sit right underneath, uh, right in here. They're tucked right in there. And that is the area of the brain that keeps you from doing stupid things. So I tell that to all my teenagers. This is the area, unfortunately for them, that doesn't fully develop until their late 20s. So they already, they're teenagers, they're stupid by nature. Um, and I say that with all the love I can. Um, they have raging hormones. And then you add this underdeveloped prefrontal, and it's, you know, it really is a triple whammy. So, if, if you think about that, and then these teenagers might be using alcohol, marijuana, cigarettes, what have you, they're really putting themselves at a disadvantage. So this is a picture of our scans. This is an underneath view. So it's as if this person's lying on their back looking up at the ceiling. And what we're calling the prefrontal is right within here. Temporal lobes are towards the middle. So if you just drew a line right here, that really encompasses your prefrontal. And you can see here, these are all the terms that we use when we talk about the prefrontal. Empathy, judgment, planning, organizing, forethought, impulse control. This is an unhealthy prefrontal. So if I went back, right there. This is your healthy look. These potholes, which look like potholes, are not actually potholes, but low, low, low blood flow. That is impaired prefrontal activity. And these are the symptoms or the problems you're going to see when you have those kind of low areas. Lack of empathy and insight, judgment, disorganization, impulsivity. This is a big one, especially in addiction. Um, the lack of empathy and judge, judgment, and, um, lack of empathy and insight, I feel, um, and we actually, this is something um, we talk about a lot at our clinic is, you may run into, especially in addiction, people that are been diagnosed with sociopath um, personality disorder, antisocial, borderline. And I happen to think, based on what, I'm, what my work has been um, with Eamon, is that there may be a lot of brain injury that we're not considering or low activity in the brain that is producing those symptoms. If you think about your, your typical person with an antisocial personality disorder diagnosis, a lot of them are going to be um, lacking empathy, insight. They're not necessarily going to have a lot of remorse or um, understanding of the actions that they're, they're engaging in and how they hurt others. And I, I happen to think, and we, we have seen this, that a lot of those folks end up with low activity here. Not to take away that there are patterns, but I think there's more to it than just a diagnostic list. Are all cluster Bs? They're not all going to look like They're this. Not all going to look no. Like that. Yes. So borderlines, and I'll get to that with a few other scans internally. But people that have borderline personality will often have the um, activity we see with trauma, um, and they may have some of this low prefrontal. So it's kind of this combination that we'll see: is that they have the trauma activity, which is pretty common with their history. And then they'll have this kind of low impulse control that kind of puts them into that. And I think of, you know, narcissism as having a lot of overlap with antisocial. I'm just curious. You know, that is something I don't know okay. if I could identify a pattern right off the top of my head. Um, that is a good point, though. Um, it certainly could be. I mean, they're all cluster B. I'll think about that. I have to, have to think about that. It's a fun little slide. <laughs> So again, we're thinking about impulse control, decision making here. All right, so I'm going to jump ahead to um, the next 
part of the brain. Now, this is internal. This is not in the surface. This is probably familiar to most of you, the cingulate gyrus. So the cingulate is a deeper structure, runs midline from the front to the back of the brain, as you can see here. The uh, different parts of the, the cingulate do different things. So the posterior integrates memory, and it sits towards the back. This is the very back of the brain here. We're looking at it from a lateral view. The anterior, which is what ANT means here, anterior ventral and dorsal part, are involved with shifting thought and shifting emotions. And I know we've all had um, experience with, with people that have difficulty letting things go, walking away um, from a difficult situation, ruminating at night. I know I have myself. You get stuck on something. It's hard to shake it off. So with your cingulate, you're going to have that cognitive flexibility. It allows you to shift your focus. If you're in school or you're at work, you're working on a project, someone comes in and says, hey, I need your help for 30 minutes on this. You're able to get up, go over there, finish that, and come back without feeling overwhelmed. Uh, you can see options in your environment. Decisions are a little easier. Um, you can go with the flow. And that's if your cingulate works well. Now, if it doesn't work well, <laughs> I don't know. This is one of my favorite TV shows. <laughs> I love this guy. He's so funny. Um, but they're stuck. They're worried. They hold grudges. Um, they get obsessive or compulsive. Addictions come into play here. So I'm certain most of you have met with that patient who's, you know, said, well, I just can't stop myself once I get going. Compulsiveness, even though they know down the road it's going to end an absolute train wreck, they cannot control those compulsive behaviors. Uh, they can also be oppositional or argumentative. And that is something I'll often see with um, parents bringing their 13 or 14 year old in and they say, the number one problem is they cannot hear the word no. And then when they hear the word no, that's all they want to do is argue with me. And so that's where that cingulate does come into play. Right. Now this is in the internal workings again. I know we, we talked a little bit about that cingulate, and again, the cingulate runs front to back. This basal ganglia is internal too. Which I'm, this is not my favorite picture of the basal ganglia, but you can see it's deep in the brain. This is really a deeper structure look. And there are two. There's a left and a right. And some of you might recall the basal ganglia actually get involved with Parkinson's disease because that's where most of your movement and feelings are integrated in that basal ganglia area. So low activity in your basal ganglia, people have movement disorders. However, for our purposes, most of the time when I'm meeting with people, they have too much activity. And when they have overactivity there, it, it manages or it helps them um, dysregulate anxiety. So they're having panic attacks, they're having anxiety, chronic worry, they have difficulty with um, feeling at ease most of the time in their environment, thinking about PTSD, you know, they're, they're always vigilant. And part of the thing about post-traumatic stress and basal ganglia is those areas of the brain are the areas that regulate your fight or flight responses to a degree. So when someone's been in a threatening situation or trauma and repetitively exposed, they never have those basal ganglia settle down for them. So we think about symptoms, anxiety, panic, conflict avoidance. That's what this little dog's supposed to look like. Um, predicting the worst. Some folks have too much motivation, so they'll look restless. You know, you're thinking about your ADHD person, um, like they're constantly going. Uh, and then with decreased activity, we can also see some ADD symptoms as well. Okay, let me double check. I know we're, let me run through the temporal lobe. I don't want to rush, but I do want to make sure we hit one more area. This is, again, a picture of a healthy look, the underneath view, but it's in the surface. And I have an arrow right here. That's the left temporal lobe. We had the right one over here. And again, this is someone looking up at the ceiling. Now, the temporal lobe, I kind of feel like it's the undiscovered country a bit in the brain because it's a little, it's still a little mysterious. We're still learning a lot. It, in a sense, it's mysterious because unusual symptoms are linked to temporal lobe instability. Those are things such as uh, deja vu or even temporal lobe seizures that are very unusual. 
people that have intense spiritual experiences, we suspect there's some interaction with the temporal lobe. And not to take away from any spiritual experiences people have, but what our studies are showing is that they have more activity in that temporal lobe than one would imagine in someone who has not had those kind of experiences. It integrates music, rhythm, social cues. Uh, it helps with integrating auditory information, visual information as far as like language. Uh, but it's also involved with mood stability. And this will come into play with my case earlier, Mr. EJ. Plus, we also know that the hippocampus might be a familiar term. That's one of the main memory centers in the brain. It's deep inside that temporal lobe. So memory becomes an important part of the temporal lobe function. So people that have memory, temporal lobe problems will have memory problems. They'll have emotional instability, panic, aggression, even headaches or learning problems. A typical picture of someone that I see who's had temporal lobe injury, and often it is physical injury, they are angry, short-tempered, irritable. They, they just go into rages at times. They may have very dark thoughts, dark thoughts meaning chronic suicidal thinking, homicidal thinking. Uh, you, know, we, I, you know, I certainly don't mean to go off on, on uh, recent events, but things like the Parkland shooter, you wonder about his brain. I certainly have wondered, um, you know, did he have low temporal lobe activity? Were there other issues that were happening inside? So, but that temporal lobe is, is, is really characterized by aggression, anger, um, and even those memory issues. Okay, so it's just 10. Maybe, I don't see Betty. Um, perhaps we should take a break. You guys can stretch, and then I'll go through the rest of this. Um, and then we can definitely have some questions at the end. Okay, I hate to cut everybody short, but I want to get through all these slides. And uh, I think that the consensus has been this is a pretty good um, informative thing. And so I want to give you as much information as I can. A lot of great questions that came up on the break that I actually i am going to go through towards the end of the presentation. So I want to make sure I hit those for everybody. Um, but feel free if you need to go up and use the restroom, get something to eat. Um, so I wanted to keep going through our pictures of uh, the different systems of the brain. I have the deep limbic system here. So we're getting back into that interior picture. And the deep limbic system, I'm certain it's familiar to most of you, that is what is integrating mood, emotion, sets the emotional tone, it helps with bonding, uh, charged memories, meaning memories that are very um, intensely linked to emotions. And then uh, a few other things come up with that deep limbic. This is an area that we'll see get lit up with post-traumatic stress as well. So your limbic, your thalamus right in here. These are the problems we'll see with people that have uh, limbic uh, problems. So moody, sad, negative, social isolation. Now jumping back a minute to the surface of the brain. The surface ha contains the parietal lobe as well, which is kind of the crown right here. Parietal lobe is for sensory processing, directional sense. It involves spatial um, integration, helps you localize where you are in space, helps with left and right distinguishment, reading, arithmetic, creating maps. That's a big one for that parietal lobe. And we think about the parietal lobe and the surface, we're looking right in this middle kind of chunk right there. Not good boundaries, you don't see like lines to define it, but it's right in the very central area. So people that have problems here will have impaired physician sense. They have difficulty acknowledging an illness, trouble with movement um, or seeing movement, reading, writing, math. It's also involved with early dementia. So I mentioned this earlier, Alzheimer's is one of the areas that it hits. And then the cerebellum, very back of the brain, sits above your neck. It's for, for my purposes when I was in school, it uh, coordinated movements, hand and eye, fine motor. We're learning more now that it does a little bit um, extra than that and probably will learn, continually learn more about it. It's very much integrating uh, activity between the cerebellum and the prefrontal. So there's a lot of traffic between these two structures. And so executive function becomes an issue with cerebellar uh, problems. It integrates the speed of your brain. 
So people that have slow cerebellums will have slow thought processing. They'll have gait coordination, balance issues. So I'm going to kind of jump a little bit back towards thinking about patients. That was uh, our primer on brain systems. But I want to jump back into our case in a moment, but also show you a few more images. So looking at these two, um, you know, clear question, would you treat these people the same? And I certainly wouldn't. You can tell that this surface is pretty nice, pretty healthy. And I, I can tell you that for certain. But this is, you can also see, very smooth. And then this person's surface looks pretty um, low, low activity in the temporal lobes, prefrontal. So here's what I want to do. And this, this is kind of hitting on some of the questions that came up at break. I want to go through the different patterns of addiction that we see in the scans. And they correlate with symptoms and treatment. We have identified six where I work, six types of addiction patterns. So it doesn't mean there are more, but these are the key six ones we focus on. So the first picture I have up here is the compulsive brain. You might remember that picture of uh, OCD, uh, Mr. Monk from the TV show. If we were to scan his brain, it probably looks just like this. This is a deeper look in the brain. This red line, midline, is the cingulate. So the cingulate is that area that, again, if you recall, allows you to be flexible. Go with the flow, let things go. Too much activity, which is what this represents. There's too much going on in that cingulate and people develop these symptoms. That's type 1. So I'm certain all of us can think about a type 1 uh, patient we've seen in addiction. Now, if we have a type 2, that is someone that has low prefrontal. Prefrontal being that impulse control center. You can see, again, those kind of potholes in the very front of this person's brain. These are people that are easily distracted. They're bored. They're very impulsive. Um, Type 3, which is a combo of 1 and 2. Good, I'm glad someone laughed over that. Um, <laughs> took me a while to find that, that cartoon. So basically, they have a lot of the first and the second. They're compulsive and they're impulsive. They're just a, you know, uh, really struggling. Sad and emotional. So this is type 4. The key issues here, these are the people that look depressed. Now, I know that there will be questions, or you're probably thinking, well, how do we know they're really depressed if they're using? And so that is always the question that you have to think about. How do I distinguish between someone who may be in withdrawal or using and someone who's actually suffering from clinical depression? So that does take time. You have to do detox or you have to get them through withdrawal, assess them a few weeks or even a month later. Um, I know the DSM is a little more strict. But these are the symptoms that you're going to think about with a sad or emotional um, patient who is also dealing with addiction. And the thing about our work is that we're adding in that imaging. So you're going to see high limbic or thalamus activity. And they're going to have that kind of low prefrontal. Type 5 is the anxious type. So we mentioned the compulsive type, which is the activity that's over um, in the cingulate, front to back. These structures here, these two red areas that look like lima beans, those are the basal ganglia. So we're going to see high activity there. And they're going to fit this profile. They think about the worst case scenario. They're self-medicating. They're anxious. And then your temporal lobe, which again is, happens to be one of my favorite. And I'm not certain why, except that they're, these are just people when you discover the problem, and it can really transform their life. But they're going to have that picture I mentioned earlier, angry, irritable, moody, learning or memory. And you can see here, those are those unhealthy temporal lobes right here. So going back to Mr. EJ, so I ordered lab work. Pretty, um, pretty basic stuff. We did some thyroid. We always do thyroid. We will check testosterone and pretty much everyone, even women, will look at cortisol levels. Uh, and then we did our imaging. And we did the neurocognitive testing. This is a, I, I, I'm certain that this is very familiar. This is the interview I like. It's pretty thorough. You're going to get most of what you need throughout this. Um, so initiation, patterns of use, treatment history, periods of abstinence, um, what helped, uh, relapse, and then risk assessment. DSM-5 criteria, which I'm sure all of us are familiar with too. Uh, and this is uh, 
it's very similar to four, except they've took, taken out the legal part. So you have cravings, increased amounts, loss of control, social relationships, hazardous, psychological, recreational activities given up, withdrawal intolerance. So this is my patient's images. So this is what we got when he first came in. I'm going to pause a minute. I want you guys to take a look. I'm not trying to um, put you on the spot, but if anyone has some ideas on what you are picking up here. There's no grades, I promise. Maybe I can't tell accurately, but it doesn't seem there's any residual signs of trauma from the motor vehicle accident. I was thinking initially frontal, frontal to the oral. Prefrontal right here, you're right, temporal here, and then this is his parietal area. So actually, we are seeing some changes from the motor vehicle. It's in the temporal region. Um, and the temporal lobe, I referred to it earlier, good pickup though. Um, the temporal lobe sits in the uh, cavity in the skull, surrounded by the minor sphenoid wing. I know these are a lot of technical words you might be not as familiar with right now, but that is a very sharp part of the skull. Any jostling of that soft brain, uh, that butter brain, you're going to cut on those edges. And so temporal lobes, very common injury with anything that's like a motor vehicle accident. Remember this guy played football, um, both in college and high school. And I, he was a big guy, so I believe he played tackle. Um, and these are his uh, views of his left and right temporal lobes. So actually, we did uh, believe that this was injury. This mm -hmm. area, though, at the very front, those potholes, if you remember, that says prefrontal. So he has pretty low activity going on in there, too. And then his parietal lobe was interesting. I'll get into that in a moment. But those are the things we saw on his surface. And his internal structure was so low. The internal imaging, all of the blood flow was so low, we, I didn't include it. And part of it is being low because he's losing blood flow in the surface. All right, so what addiction type? These are his symptoms. Thinking about his pictures, I know you've got a lot of information um, in that handout. Anything jump out at you? What would you say this guy might fit into? Six. Good. Six. Yeah. Um, that's temporal, right? Yeah. Good. Yes. Um, so uh, that's what I thought he had too. He has a little mixture though of prefrontal. So it's kind of that mixture of one and six. Now, I'm going to come back to him in a moment. I want to share with you a different patient. I'm not going to go into as much detail with her, but I think this is a very interesting um, patient, and she's one of my favorites. So I saw her about a year and a half ago. Beautiful young lady, 26, um, cosmetologist, beautiful skin, hair, just lovely young lady. Um, and she's um, coming in because she can't stop heroin use. She's actually on Suboxone and still shooting up. And um, parents are just beside themselves. Multiple rehab admissions. Uh, careful history turns out she was sexually assaulted um, when she was using. She was, um, took off for California, ended up in some really unsavory places, uh, and was sexually assaulted a while high. Had an ADD diagnosis as a child. This is someone that was so shut down, so shameful of her past and, and her life, she didn't even want us to get into most of the trauma didn't want us to bring it up. Didn't even want to be asked. Uh, this is what her scans looked like. So in our comparison to Mr. EJ, if you look at her top-down view, it's not bad. I mean, it's pretty smooth. You can see her profiles. I really expected more kind of ravaging here because of the heroin use, but we don't see that. Um, we do see those, this portion at the very top again, being that prefrontal. So low. Temporal lobes look good. So a little bit of what we call scalloping here, bumpy areas, but overall, the, not a terrible looking surface. This is her internal picture. Now, I should have, I kind of should have included a, a healthy look to compare, but because I'm going to have to go back pretty far to show you a healthy comparison. However, this is the diamond we'll see with trauma. So, someone who's had trauma history will have this diamond in the very limbic area of their brain, this top area. You have her cingulate lit up, which prevents her from letting go. Her basal ganglia, the fight or flight centers, and that deep limbic area, the thalamus, 
which is integrating those charged emotions for her. So when we see this, we know her history, we can see, I, I would clearly say this is post-traumatic stress, not just based on our scans, but also on her history and presentation. And it's PTSD that hasn't yet been addressed. She's been in treatment centers, but as you probably are aware, um, a lot of people get focused on you know, keeping them alive, keeping them away from heroin. Um, and this, we really felt, was holding her back from completing treatment. So thinking about what type of pattern, this is a little tricky because I'm throwing in that PTSD red herring. It's not a red herring, but it's just PTSD. So she's impulsive, worried, stuck, anxious. What do you think of those six? Yeah, very good. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I'll tell you, I'm kind of putting you guys on the spot and asking you know, which type, which type. Often people blend, so there isn't just one. So again, and I, I mean, this might be um, not, this is, I know this is new information for, for our clinicians, but there is, I feel it's very important to treat co-occurring disorders um, because we miss these. I think you're going to still see people spin in treatment and not move forward. So picking up on cyclical mood disorders, B TBI, PTSD, ADD even is a huge one. So I'm going to jump back to Mr. EJ, our football player. He had the very pockmarked brain, um, mainly in the surface. We identified he has some TBI. I mentioned sleep apnea. It actually turns out when he was tested with primary care, he has pretty uh, severe sleep apnea. We identified he has an alcohol use disorder. He hadn't actually recognized that, and you know his patterns were um, three bottles of wine a night. Um, and we found out he also has hypothyroid. So our treatment here is the low, and a lot of this will be familiar. Um, naltrexone, which I happen to like a lot um, for the, the alcohol uh, relapse and uh, even for cravings. I gave him a mood stabilizer for that irritability and temporal lobe activity um, that was low because his, his anger was getting in the way of a lot of treatment, a lot of relationship issues. Once he was stabilized with the mood stabilizer, I actually used a dopamine agonist. So this was targeting that prefrontal. Um, I believe I gave him Wellbutrin. It's not a clear dopamine agonist, but it's an um, antidepressant that has a low of dopamine activity. So we're boosting that prefrontal activity, which is where he's getting into trouble with impulsivity. I think um, you know, you'll be as, as familiar as I know with CBT. He's in a 12-step program now. And we also included a lot of um, comprehensive approach. So it isn't just about the specifics of his, uh, his substance use, but we also put him through some treatments to help with his brain injury and his overall health. So he lost about, I want to say about 30 pounds on a diet that we put him on, we got him exercising pretty routinely, medications, um, supplements, and hyperbarics is something um, you may not be as familiar with. I know down in Virginia Beach, I believe, um, they have a lot of hyperbarics for the returning vets, um, and that's to heal brain injury. We use that pretty frequently. So here's his pictures. Before on the left, on the right we have uh, the scans uh, after treatment. So you can see that there's some pretty, improve, pretty nice improvement. It's not perfect, but you can tell his temporal lobes have really nicely filled out. This is that top-down parietal area, prefrontal. So, and this was about nine months later. He's still on the program. We're still working with him, but um, this was nice for him to see. He had put so much work into this. He and his wife were working on their marriage. Um, she had been pretty much ready to walk. So uh, this was really gratifying. What supplements did you give him? We gave him a, a blend of uh, supplements that we've put together for our football players. Uh, Hooperzine A, phosphatidylserine, N-acetylcysteine, which is something I know has a lot of study and research for addiction, uh, uh, vinpocetine, ginkgo biloba. So it's kind of the, that blend that boosts blood flow, improves acetylcholine production. Really? Yes. Yeah. Um, omega-3. We believe in omega-3. <laughs> Okay, I know I'm jumping back and forth. This is my young 26-year-old, beautiful female, heroin. So this was the plan, that, or this is the, the identification we made. So she had PTSD, 
we also identified she had an ADD disorder that hadn't really been treated since um, she was in grade school. And she was dealing with major depression. So we targeted her treatment right in here. And we use so serotonin and dopamine. So if you think about your type 3, which is what she was, type 3, we're trying to boost that prefrontal. I'm sorry, type, type 3, you're boosting the prefrontal. You're calming the cingulate. And so for her, both of these were important. And that's because these two, these two chemicals work on those different structures. We put her through EMDR, which was actually a wonderful thing to see because she, um, in the first few sessions, she, she felt so much better. Her, um, her anxiety improved. And she uh, was able to actually, after, even just after three or four, had really improved a great deal. She um, just started back to talk therapy after that. So EMDR, we really believe in. Um, I've seen it work very well. Nutrition supplementation. So anyone I know, you're probably familiar, people are using opiates. May, most of your substances, people are not eating well. They're not getting good nutrients. They'll, they'll have depleted protein levels. So we put her through a program with nutrition. So I do not have a scan of her. Um, she has not done another scan yet. So once I do get her back in, we'll be able to track her treatment. But I put up here, this is a slide someone had asked me earlier. Um, they said, well, this is great information, but what do we do about all this? So this is the slide I, I thought would be helpful. And I'm sorry, I tucked it all the way to the back. But I've broken it down to the different types that we've talked about. You, we've talked about just so far that type 1, really, and the type 3, and type 6. But when we think about our brain imaging in these different types, this is what we're going to, this is a very basic approach. Now, there's more nuance to each of these and it depends on the patient personally. But when you think about type 1, you're thinking about that compulsive patient, the, the Mr. Monk. You want to calm that brain down with some serotonin. That doesn't mean um, that's the only thing you do, but it is a big one because serotonin calms that anterior cingulate. Dopamine for the type 2, the prefrontal, the impulsive type. Type 3 being the combination. Type 4, we were looking at that depressed, lethargic, the Eeyore uh, from Winnie the Pooh. Um, and you want to use a combination of an antidepressant or maybe a little bit of dopamine, vitamin D3. And then type 5 is your anxious patient, GABA, B6, magnesium are the natural methods. We use some... Uh, some prescriptions too, but type, type 5 is the tricky, and I'm sure you guys are familiar. Anyone with anxiety who's been on Xanax and you're trying to get them off, that's a real trick. So I usually avoid most sedatives, all sedatives really, if we can. And these are the ways we'll approach that anxious patient. Um, type 6, so I mentioned earlier with our male guy, um, learning memory supplements, GABA, mood stabilizers. I'm kind of just, I'll, I can probably skip through this a little bit. These are medicines that I routinely use. I know some of them are familiar. Therapies that I know are out there. I think I talked with someone about um, mindfulness training earlier at the break. DBT, CBT, acceptance, commitment. So I'm kind of a mixture of CBT and mindfulness. Yes? Are you in your clinic or in the surrounding area using PMS? We are, yes. Not at our clinic. We do not have a, uh, we don't have a machine, but we do refer frequently to the local group, and they do a great job. So I should have included that, but TMS is something. It's off-label for addiction, but it's used, um, we use it a lot for those co-occurring disorders. And I've seen really nice improvement for people. And that's, I'm sorry if, if not everyone's familiar. Uh, TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's kind of the newer ECT. Covered by um, Medicare, uh, covered by most insurances now, at least for the initial uh, six weeks of treatment. Very effective. There's no medications that you have to be on, although most people are on them. Uh, and so they can go, they get the treatment five days a week. It takes about six weeks for a full set of treatment. And I'm thinking about it specifically because of this cerebral blood flow. Yes. It has exactly. an emphasis that you've been on. Exactly. And the prefrontal, you make a great point, because the prefrontal um, actually can predict good response to uh, TMS, because low activity there will see a nice response. It's correlated. You're absolutely right with the blood flow. Okay. Yes? 
gone through a lot of material, which is organized differently than I'm used to thinking about it. Do you have some publications you recommend? They have a whole um, library online. Yes, it includes tons of research publications. So I'll make certain that you guys get that um, on our, uh, hopefully Darlene maybe can send out an email with some um, extra information. And I know someone wanted posters too. So yes. Yes, sir. Um, I was interested in what the cost is for. <coughs> oh, for a scan? They can be costly because we, um, we're using a technetium isotope. The camera is costly to use. So it's about, depending on how many scans, about 1,500 to 2,000, maybe a little bit more. So usually uh, that more, maybe more for someone to afford when they're in treatment. They've been through several sessions. So I, um, several sessions of rehab or IOP. So I'll usually encourage people to just come in. We will meet with you. You do not have to have a scan done. But it, with our approach, we already think in that manner. We're thinking about a brain activity. When I, you know, I see somebody, I'm thinking, okay, that person probably has more cingulate than they should and et cetera. So that can be very helpful because our algorithm, algorithm for treatment is much different than if you're going to see somebody who's in a general uh, practice. And I know this personally because I used to be that general practice uh, physician. Does insurance cover any other some thing? of them, um, some of the insurances do. Yes, I can't tell you which ones, but a lot of them do. A lot of Tricare apparently covers, which is your military or retired or VA. Ah, so back to type one. Kind of already talked about that. These are just a little more details for you. I want to make sure we stay on time. I think I have until 11. Does that sound right? OK. Um, and I want to give some time for questions at the end. So type 1, we're calming that cingulate. These are the natural methods that we'll use. CBT, aerobic exercise, complex carbs. So interestingly enough, you don't want everybody on a low carb diet because it may not help their brain the way they need it. Complex carbs help maintain um, serotonin levels. So it, it's complex carbs like sweet potatoes, chickpeas, um, oatmeal, <laughs> things like that. You don't want them on the white rice or pasta or bread. Uh, let's see. Type 2, impulsive. And again, we're supporting that prefrontal. I mentioned some of the prescriptions available, supplements. Because I love this blend um, of the green tea, rhodiola, ginseng, works very well. Uh, ADD therapies, neurofeedback falls in here. Um, lots of aerobic exercise because you want to get that blood flow going in their brain. And a protein, more of a protein-based diet because that will help with dopamine production. Type 3, we have a combo of 1 and 2. And again, we kind of hit on which neurochemicals you're enhancing. The limbic system, and I referred to this earlier, that's that hot thalamus, that overactive thalamus. You're treating depression here. So it isn't just selecting an antidepressant, but it's also thinking about what types of therapy. I believe in vitamin D. Vitamin D um, just seems to be a new study every week supporting its use. Uh, it helps with serotonin production, neurocognitive connections, mood. Um, Exercise, aerobic exercise, very important, but you want to get them involved in like a social setting because most of the time these people are pretty withdrawn. And then TMS down here. And I, and I think we could certainly include it in the type one as well. So it depends on uh, who has, oh, okay. Um, I'll usually test their levels. Um, most people fall in the 30 range. We actually believe, and this is based on the studies that we are looking at, that you should be closer to 60 to 80 nanograms. So I, um, I'll often encourage people to start just taking 5,000 a day. Yeah. Is somebody just one type? Oh, very, very infrequent. <laughs> it, it can to a degree. Most of the time, it's it, again, that's kind of where we have to think about that, that patient presentation, too. It's not just simply looking at the scans. You have to get that history. and. You have to really think about that person and what makes them up. So you're right. It, it tends to be a bit of a blend. And sometimes I'm just not quite sure. And so that first visit, you know, we're just, I'm trying to get them to come back for that second. And that's, that's the key. It still seems like to go at it in this way is, is a fantastic idea. And the cost of the scan is nothing. Because well, so you change someone's life. Right. Exactly. And that's usually how I'm trying to encourage them. I mean, it is very costly. I know. Because, um, 
I've done them myself, but I feel it was, it's beneficial enough. Uh, the type 5, I kind of hit on this. This one is a bit of a challenge, of course, because you'll have people who are just so wound up, so anxious, um, and they want to use what works fast, which is your Xanax, your Klonopin, all of those things that are huge no-nos in my mind. Um, CBT can be helpful, social skills, relaxation exercises, and I know we talked earlier about mindfulness, deep breathing, meditation, uh, and then non-sedative medicines for anxiety. Those are things like Buspar. I'm not huge on Buspar, but it's, it's, it does work for some people. Um, there is uh, somebody who came up to me, I'm trying to remember, and we talked a little about neurofeedback. That's right. And um, I have seen neurofeedback benefit some people who have anxiety only. Now, most people don't just have anxiety, but it has some benefit in that field. So that would be another option to include in this. And then temporal lobes, which are type 6. And I kind of think we've, we've gone through this pretty thoroughly. Um, again, that treating that co-occurring TBI, I think, is very important. So my basic approach to every type, kind of thinking about, well, which type this person is, really the best approach sometimes if I'm not certain um, on a clear, a clear approach, not often that that's the case, but... Sleep management is essential. It's when the brain is healing. You want to get them into REM sleep. Of course, with substance abuse, everybody sleeps terribly. Um, and so that's often a huge challenge. Diet, exercise, um, craving control, getting them into meaningful activities, so helping them find some purpose in life. A lot of them um, have lost that. Um, they don't necessarily have that meaningful reason to get up in the morning. Um, so helping them discover that and then the dual diagnosis. Oh, wow, that's everything. <laughs> so I hate that I've said through, um, but we do have a few, you know, a little bit of time for questions. If there are other things that are in the scan or in the uh, slides that you want me to go through, I'm happy to do that too. I know for a lot of folks, let's don't produce no. How do you kind of I'll give it to them at night. So I'll have them take it at bedtime. Now, some people have developed an insomnia. So what I'll do is I'll split it up and I'll take half in the morning, half at night. It's a little tough for anyone to take more than once a day, but that's how I usually approach it. Mm -hmm. um, I work in trauma recovery and I see a lot of women with PTSD and a handful with dissociative stuff. Um, what do you see with brain activity with dissociation? So with dissociation, we'll see a lot of that limbic activity most of the time. Um, let me see if I can go back. Oh, yeah. Uh, she said that she, you work a lot with people, women, who have PTSD, trauma, and dissociation. So she asked what kind of pictures the scans will show us. And I was, I don't know if I can find it quickly, but usually it's that overactivity in the limbic system. A lot of times it's involving some of the right temporal lobe, too, because the right temporal lobe gets involved with regulating um, our, our cognitive awareness uh, and integrating what's going on. So people that have too much activity deep in the right temporal will see people develop those kind of dissociative symptoms. And, and often, you'll want to kind of think about, is there a seizure disorder underneath all of this, too? So ruling that out may be important. With opiates, different types of opiates, do you see that affect the brain differently? Like if somebody has a pill addiction versus heroin, does it pretty much affect the brain the same? Great question. I have not seen a difference yet. Um, People ask me, well, what about Suboxone? You know, that's an opiate too, or methadone. Um, those actually, at least methadone has shown that it kind of drops that blood flow in the brain. We have less data with Suboxone because it is fairly new. I know it's been around about 15 years now, but um, definitely methadone and pain, pain pills, heroin, all seem to do the kind of same pattern. How common is bipolar? I hear that so <laughs> Well, I think there's probably about 40% of people that have a cyclical mood disorder that is involving, you know, kind of co-occurring with that substance use. Now, that's a, that's a rough estimate because I also have read that there may be closer to 60 or 70. Just my experience, it seems about in that 40, 50 range. Um, with medicinal marijuana, is your opinion that, I mean, I know you, it sounded like you were addressing marijuana as a whole, but do you yes. see any value in the medicinal product 
the medicinal part, meaning CBD, is that mainly what you're thinking? Yeah, because that's the hot thing now. Everyone familiar with CBD? Cannabidiol oil is the pretty typical um, way it's used. But I think there's actually some interesting stuff happening with CBD. And I would not say that, it, I'm not clumping that into marijuana being bad, not, not message I gave earlier. Because I think there's, there's some really interesting research coming out of using that. There's something, there's a couple of um, randomized control trials that were done looking at CBD and antipsychotics going head to head. And they're apparently, um, they're pretty much head to head effective, meaning that CBD has clearly some uh, mental health benefits that we just still have to uncover. Um, am I recommending everybody get on CBD right now for their anxiety? No. But I do have patients who are coming in using the, the oil and they are getting benefits. The thing about CBD is that your source becomes very important because I've gone into gas stations and they're selling it. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm not going to buy it here. <laughs> and I'm surely not going to tell my patients to. But um, I think you really, and that is where the FDA probably at some point is going to step in and regulate it. So that's the best I can tell you. Um, I've seen it mainly oil, and there's some companies up in New York that, some pharmacies and companies up in New York that I've seen it sell as oil. I don't know about the pill form. I, I, that's actually, you're thinking about the, um, the Marinol, which is a little bit different. That's the one they're using for like nausea with someone who has cancer. So it's a little bit different um, formulation. So CBD is just pure cannabidiol. And so most of what I understand is it's coming in the oil form. about feedback. <laughs> um, I'll tell you with sleep, I, I agree. I think it's, it's one of the things that if people don't sleep well as soon as possible, they're, they're much more likely to relapse. I usually, um, this, and, and I'll tell you, I don't have a perfect answer for that, but what I'll usually encourage there is, um, are, you're familiar with like CBT for sleep, and so that usually is basically sleep hygiene, getting them to a routine. But I've seen that take a couple of weeks at least, if not longer, um, just to get them to sleep a little bit better, just see some measure of improvement. And then what I'll usually do is encourage them to use some natural things. So magnesium is a big thing for me, melatonin, um, calming supplements. But often I'm using a prescription. And it's not, I do not use any of the sedatives. But if they're not sleeping, my concern is that I'm going to lose them. I tend to gravitate towards trazodone. It's, I found, and some of the studies show that it's the most likely to replicate in, in a pharmaceutical way, REM, which is what we're aiming for. Do you love melatonin? Mm -hmm. I do. Um, I love magnesium. So if you're not using magnesium, I, would, I think most of us are deficient in it from what I've read. And that actually is a nice natural way to treat depression, too. You spoke about you tend to dose vitamin D3. Yes. I, you know what, I can't think of the exact milligram, but there's a product I call Natural Calm, which is basically citrate, magnesium citrate. It's going to move your bowels, but that's not a bad thing for most of us. Um, <laughs> and I think the starting dose is the half a teaspoon in some water, and you would start with that at night. You can actually increase it every couple of nights up until um, you have some GI movement, and then you can back off a little. But I've seen that really help a ton with sleep quality as well as just kind of resting that brain, that active, anxious brain. Natural calm, and you can get it online on Amazon. I found it in Whole Foods very easily. I've even seen it, I think, in Harris Teeter. It's citrate, yeah. Now, the glycinate, the 3 and 8, we'll use that for um, those active basal ganglia, too. But the citrate is just my go-to for sleep. Sorry. What's your opinion as a physician, your therapist recommending supplements in these kinds? I said, I mean, this is kind of a touchy you know, subject, yeah. and um, just curious your opinion. I um I actually welcome it most of the time, yeah, because I can't do everything, and 
Um, I, as long as I have a good relationship with that therapist and you know we have a good trust built up, I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, if it's somebody I don't know well and they're seeing my patient, I'm a little uneasy because then you know I don't know their their knowledge base and they don't know mine. So that's where I think the relationship is important. So do you recommend? I know for me, standard I would refer to a functional medicine or just to a physician mm -hmm. in general for some basic blood work and then open the lines of communication. From yes. that standpoint, yeah. is that what you would recommend? That would be a great way to approach it. Because your functional medicine doctor is, or even a, a very aware primary care is going to be a great place to start because, again, that medical piece I feel is so critical. If we miss something there, their thyroid's low, their testosterone's in the tank, you're not going to get them better. So, yeah, I think it's a great approach. Yeah? Are you seeing more movement in that direction towards acceptance? Well, acceptance. <laughs> You know, more than I ever thought I would, but yes. Um, there's still a lot of pushback. Um, you know, your, your big medical systems, and I won't mention any by names, but um, they're, they're always going to get into, they've got too much cingulate activity. They're just stuck on one path, and they can't think outside the box. And <laughs> I have to say, I used to be part of that system, and so you can, I see how easy it is, and if you're, if you're not seeing improvement, which is what I was struggling with, I worked on uh, dual diagnosis. I was medical director of dual diagnosis up um, in uh, Boston, and I saw people come back three, four times a month, and they would stay for three or four days, and they'd leave, and then they'd come back. It was just that revolving door, and I thought, there's got to be a better, better way to do this. This is just not working. <laughs> and so I think once docs, uh, you know, keep that open mind, and uh, ego can get in the way too. Egos, whether it's a physician or a therapist, or you know, you want to just be open-minded. Not everything is scientific and based, and but just be open-minded and do your research. That's hopefully what I imagine the medical field's moving towards. Do you design some of this at your clinic? We don't uh, offer it right now, but we have several um, therapists that will refer to, yeah, locally. And what was the other, other form of magnesium that you mentioned? Oh, glycinate and threonate. So if you go to any whole, uh, not whole, well, whole foods, sure, but if you're going to go to like a vitamin shop or online, there will be different types of uh, magnesium. And it's really those, those other two tend to be more um, beneficial for people that have the, the high activity in that basal ganglia, those anxious folks. So glycinate, I believe, is... Um, the one that we'll use in our supplement. Three and eight's pretty good too, but glycinate tends to be ours. And then the citrate is the one I'll use at night for sleep. Well, I know I've covered a lot. I think it's been a great audience. You guys asked wonderful questions. Thank you.